Hey, this is a compressor. It compresses audio. And this one I've built myself. Let's talk about it. In my previous video, in which I compared all the microphones that I own, I made an honest mistake of setting my gain dials on the XLR microphones too high with an explanation that I normally run my microphones into an outboard compressor that requires it. A few of my subscribers reached out if I could show said compressor and talk about it, so here we are. This is a replica of the famous Teletronics LA-2A optical compressor that I use when recording my voice for YouTube. And as you can see, including now. So why does a tiny YouTuber like myself need a compressor, you might ask? Well, in all honesty, I don't. But as to why I use it anyway, we have to go back around six years. During a skydiving exercise in a wind tunnel, I dislocated my shoulder so badly that I needed surgery. Now for those of you who have never hurt an important joint such as shoulders, it takes a lot of time to heal post-surgery. Six months at least, with the initial three months of complete immobility and very strict doctor's orders to rest. Which meant one thing, I had heaps of time on my hands. Now, those of you who know me personally know that I'm not the one to sit still for months on end and feel sorry for myself, so I decided I'll learn something new. And as I'm quite interested in audio gear in general, I always wondered how the audio signal works from an electrical point of view. And after some googling, the choice became clear. Build a compressor. And not just any compressor, but the iconic LA-2A, which despite being almost 60 years old, is still one of the most respected optical compressors out there, and they still cost upward from $4,500, and any respectable recording studio has one in their arsenal. So, what is it so special about it that it warrants such a steep price? Before we go into that, let's first talk about what a compressor is. As the name suggests, it compresses audio, but not in a WinZip kind of way. It compresses the dynamic range by lowering the volume when it reaches a certain value. In simpler terms, think of it like this. Our voice is very dynamic in volume, and as we speak, some parts of our words, especially pauses between them when we take a breath, are very quiet, and others, such as when we talk with excitement, use emphasis, or just start a new sentence, can be very loud. If we open a recording in a software such as Adobe Audition, or in my case, Isotope Audio Editor, you can clearly see that the loud parts are very brief and then the loudness returns to a more normal levels. However, we always aim for those normal levels to be as loud as possible, but we cannot just dial it up. Our peaks will go off the charts, which will result in what we know as clipping. This is me, clipping. But why do our normal levels need to be as loud as possible in the first place? Well, because there are upper technological limits that our audio levels can't go above. If you right click on this video and select stat for nerds, you will see a section that says volume slash normalized. Ideally, this value is 100 slash 100%, but the interesting part is in the parenthesis that says content loudness and is ideally a negative value, but as close to zero as possible. In YouTube's case, that zero is set to minus 14 LUFS. I won't go into details, but in a nutshell, LUFS or loudness units are used in the process of quantifying a piece of audio's perceived loudness by analyzing the average level over time. This is how it looks like in DaVinci Resolve, but your mileage may vary. If you want to hear more on the matter, uh, Jason Yedlovsky has a lot of videos about it. Link in the description down below. Now that we have the prerequisite knowledge about audio levels, let's imagine I talk really quietly for 95% of the video and then say something very loud. Because we need to account for the loudest part of the recording, you will struggle to hear my voice when talking quietly. This is a very quiet part of the sentence. And this is a very loud one. But watch what happens if I compress it. This is a very quiet part of the sentence. And this is a very loud one. Now bear in mind this compression was done digitally with software, but we can also compress the analog way, which is where this optical compressor comes in. But what does it mean optical? Well, just as there are multiple ways to skin the proverbial cat, there is also multiple ways to compress audio the analog way, and optically is one of those ways. Here's how it works. 
When an analog audio signal travels through a wire, it does so in the form of electricity. The louder the signal, the higher the voltage, or if we show it on a graph, the amplitude. So what every compressor needs to do is, when the voltage passes a certain, usually configurable threshold, it needs to lower that voltage. But it cannot just cut it, it's an analog device after all, it needs to do so gradually, which is why many compressors have attack and release settings, which basically mean how long the transition to lower the volume takes and vice versa for release. Optical compressors do not have those settings though, because their attack and release settings are fixed. Here's how this compressor works. When the audio signal comes into it, it splits into two separate paths, or chains as they're called, the main one and what is often referred to as a side chain. The side chain signal then goes into a special closed box called optical attenuator with just two elements, a light bulb and a photoresistor. As our signal gets louder, the bulb in the box shines brighter and our photoresistor increases its resistance, which in turn is then applied to lower the signal in our main audio chain. And this is also the reason why this particular compressor doesn't have attack or release settings. It comes down to choosing and pairing the right light bulb with the right photoresistor. But this compressor wouldn't cost $4,500 brand new if there wasn't more to it. Especially when the same process can be easily replicated by a free software plugin. So what is it? Well, it's character. As this is an analog device, every passive component that the main signal chain goes through leaves a mark on the audio in a manner of speaking. Some components more than others. For example, when the signal enters this compressor, it does so through a, what is called an input transformer and leaves it through what is called an output transformer. Combined, they cost around $250. And as any audio engineer will tell you, transformers add width to the vocals. It might sound odd, but that's how it sounds when compared to a signal that bypasses the compressor entirely. The next relevant element are the tubes. If you follow any kind of audio related content here on YouTube, you will know that many people People swear by them as they give a certain warmth to the signal. And the ones that usually sound the best are also the ones that are really old but never used. The term for these is new old stock or NOS for short. My particular tubes are from the year 1976 and each of the four I have in here costs around $100. Two of these tubes are used to amplify the side chains and two are used to amplify the output gain, also known as a markup gain. In our case, markup gain is the other side of the coin when it comes to compression. It's how much you amplify the signal after it has been compressed, lifting the average loudness. And finally, we get to the optical attenuator. There's a bug. And finally, we get to the optical attenuator. As I said, it's a relatively simple part from an engineering standpoint, and yet it has a big impact on the signal as it impacts how fast, or should I say how slow, it starts compressing when needed. Unlike FET compressors, whose attack and release times we measure in milliseconds, we measure optical compressors' release time in seconds, and that's a good thing. The compression is applied more gently, broadly, and sounds more natural, which is also something very desirable. You, as a listener, should never hear the compression being applied. If you do, it means it's overdone. So how did I go from, hey, I have this idea from building my own compressor to actually building it? Actually, it was much easier than you might think. During my research, I stumbled upon a website called Analog Vibes, I'll leave the link in the description down below. It's a project by a gentleman named Martin Zobel who's super enthusiastic about the vintage audio gear. To the point he decided he'll find vendors who can manufacture replica cases of those devices, LA2A being one of them. Now here comes the best part. If you buy a chassis from Martin, you will also receive the full bill of materials and a complete step-by-step -step guide which makes assembling this compressor a piece of cake. The beauty of this approach is that you don't need to strictly follow any of it. You're free to choose, say, a different type of resistor or a different manufacturer of the transformers or any other component for that matter. And boy, did I stray away from it. Where Martin recommends resistors with 5% tolerance, I dedicated hours to watching YouTube videos about audio electronics to settle on 1% tolerance thin film resistors that I have no experience with, can't measure their performance but cost 10 times more. Keep in mind that resistor prices are measured in cents, but when you order many of them and apply the same attitude to other components, it adds up. Now we get to the main question, do you need it? 
And here the following age-old wisdom comes true. If you have to ask, then no. Especially not for YouTube. No YouTuber in their right mind would invest into this kind of a device when you can get new lens, a light and a microphone all for the same amount of money. But for me personally, it sure as hell was a lot of fun to build and I learned a bunch of new things about how audio works on the analog level and that's a win in my book. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. If you have any questions, be sure to leave them down in the comments below. And most importantly, if you found any kind of value in it, go ahead and click that like button. See ya.